Welcome back to the second part of the belly flopper tutorial. In the last section, we finished laying out the body of our organism. Now it's time to concentrate on the neural network that will control its behavior. We're done with the body editor for the moment, so you can close it down. Then, we need to open up the editor for the behavioral system. To do this, go to the project workspace and double click on the behavioral system node. The behavioral system editor window also has several toolbars that you'll need to understand. I'll give a brief overview of what they're for and how to use them. First, let's pin the toolbox so it will remain visible throughout our work. The toolbox contains icons for all of the types of nodes that can be added to our diagram. I'll only be using a few of these nodes in this tutorial, so you'll need to consult the help files for a full description. To add a new node, simply drag it onto the diagram where you want it and drop it. So let's go ahead and add a spiking neuron to this diagram. Newly added nodes are selected by default. You can change the values of the selected nodes or links by going to the properties toolbar. You can alter any of the graphical or functional properties here. Next is the hierarchy toolbar. This shows all of the diagrams and their nodes and links in a tree structure. The behavioral system uses a hierarchical design philosophy. This means that you can have a top-level diagram that contains neural subsystems, and those subsystems can contain their own subsystems. To add a subsystem, go back to the toolbox and drag the node labeled Neural Subsystem onto the diagram. When you do, it will add a new diagram that is linked to this node. Notice that a new tab has been added at the top for this diagram. You can double click on the subsystem node to automatically drill into its diagram. Then, if you add items to this diagram, we can go back to the hierarchy and see them there as well. If you delete a hierarchy, then it deletes all the items within its diagram. This includes all subsystems that are contained within it. The next toolbar lists the neural modules. AnimatLab uses a very flexible plug-in architecture that allows anyone to create a new module that can interact with nodes created by other people. They simply have to implement the correct interfaces for everything to play nicely together. This toolbar lets you control the properties for each of these modules. This includes things like the time step used to simulate this module. Each one can have a different time step from the others and from the physics engine. The final toolbar displays any network errors and warnings. When a network gets complicated, it becomes easy to overlook doing something simple like connecting a network output to the virtual world. Your network will appear to operate correctly, but you will get no behavioral output. This toolbar helps you to debug those types of problems by providing you warnings. Now that we have a basic introduction to the behavioral editor, let's start building our neural network. Since we have four legs, we know that we'll need four subsystems, one for each leg. So let's go ahead and create the first one. Drag a neural subsystem over and drop it onto the diagram. Once it's created, change its name to be left upper leg. You can edit the text of a node by clicking on the node, waiting a second, and then clicking again. Or you can use the text property. You can change the size of a node by selecting and dragging on any of the handles that are around its edge. Let's do this to make our text easier to read. You can move the node by dragging on the border that surrounds the node. Next, let's cut the neuron we've already added by selecting it and then hitting the Control X key. Then we'll drill into the new subsystem and paste that neuron using the Control P key. So we have a neuron, but does it actually do anything? This question brings us to one of the more useful features of NMATLAB, the ability to collect data from our simulation. Let's create a line chart to see what our neuron is doing. Go to the project workspace and right click on the tool viewers node to get a pop-up menu. Then go to add tool viewer and select line chart. This will create a new line chart window. Let's go back and set its name to be left leg data. We have our chart now but we still have to tell it what we want to plot. Go to the hierarchy toolbar of the line chart and right click on the Y axis 1 node to get a pop-up menu. Select add item, 
and this displays the Add Item dialog. It lists all of the items that can be charted for all of the organisms and structures in our simulation. Select Neuron 1 on the right, you can see the properties for this data item. The most important property is the data type. Each object will have different types of data that can be collected from it. A neuron will have data types like membrane voltage and firing frequency. But a body part will have data like position on the x-axis and torque around the z-axis. Each object knows what type of data it collects and only allows you to select types that are appropriate for it. Let's keep this as membrane voltage and change the name of the data entry to 1VM. Then hit OK. Now, let's go back and click on the Y-axis 1 node and give it a more meaningful name. Change it to Membrane Voltages. Then, click on Tool Viewer 1 node and scroll down to the Title property and change it to be Left Leg Data. If we go back to our chart now, we can see that the name of our axis has changed and that our new title is displayed. Let's run our simulation and see what happens. Well, nothing really exciting happens. This neuron simply sits there at its resting membrane potential of negative 60 millivolts. Let's try and spice things up a bit by adding a current stimulus to our neuron. Go back to the behavioral editor and right click on Neuron 1 to display a pop-up menu. Select Add Stimulus at the bottom. This displays the stimulus dialog. Each object in the system knows what type of stimuli can be applied to them. So neurons can have different types of current injections, but body parts can have forces applied to them. Each part knows what is appropriate and only allows you to select those stimuli types. Double click the tonic current stimulus to add it. We can see our stimuli by going back to the project workspace. There are a few properties of all stimuli that are important. The first is the enabled value. If this is true, then the stimulus is applied. If it's false, then it's ignored. If the always active value is true, then this stimulus is active throughout the entire simulation. Let's change our current to be 30 nanoamps and then change our start time to be 0.2 seconds and the end time to be 0.5 seconds. Run the simulation again. This time we got a more interesting response. The current injection depolarizes our neuron just enough so that it exceeds its threshold potential and begins firing action potentials. Let's take a look at the current injection. Go back to the chart hierarchy and add a new axis. Then add an item. We want to chart the external current for neuron 1. Now run the simulation again. And this time we can see that 30 nanoamps of current is injected into our neuron during our stimulus time window. We'd like our arm to move back and forth. To do this, we need some type of central pattern generator to produce oscillations. There are a number of ways that neural systems can produce rhythmic output, but we will be focusing on a type of network oscillator known as a half-center oscillator. This is a combination of two or more neurons that do not oscillate on their own, but when you connect them with reciprocal inhibition, they begin to oscillate. Let's start by renaming our current neuron E back, and then add a new neuron and name it E forward. Both of our neurons need to be tonically active, so let's add a tonic stimulus. Select both neurons by holding down the control key while you select each one. 
When you change values with multiple items selected, you change that value for all of the selected items. Set the tonic noise to 0.4 millivolt, the tonic stimulus to 10 nanoamps, and then go up and set the initial threshold to negative 55 millivolts. Making this value more negative lowers the threshold for the neuron to generate action potentials. We no longer need the current stimulus that we added before. Go back to the project workspace and remove it. Now remove the current axis in our chart. Change the name of the old data item and then add a new one for the E forward. Run the simulation again and we can see that both of our neurons now fire tonically. Next, let's add the reciprocal inhibition. Go back to the behavioral editor and draw a line from E back to E forward. This will open the synapse type dialog. We want to add a hyperpolarizing IPSP chemical synapse. However, some of the settings we'll need are different from the defaults, so let's left click on that node and select Clone Synapse. Go to the name property and change it to Oscillator IPSP. Set the decay rate to 20 milliseconds, the relative facilitation to 1, and the synaptic conductance to 1 microsiemens. Synaptic conductance determines how strong the connection is between the pre- and postsynaptic neurons. Relative facilitation controls how the synaptic conductance changes when pulses arrive closely spaced in time. A facilitation rate greater than 1 means that the postsynaptic conductance tends to increase with repetitive activation. We don't want that here, so we're turning off facilitation. Hit the OK button and then draw another line between E forward and E back. Select the oscillator IPSP that we created earlier and hit OK. We now have a reciprocal inhibition between our two neurons. Let's run the simulator again. Hmm, not very rhythmic, is it? This brings up an important point about network oscillators. It's not enough that they simply inhibit each other. In this case, one neuron won and was able to inhibit the other one. This situation will remain stable. We need some way for the inhibited neuron to escape or be released from its inhibition if we want rhythmic activity. We'll do this using accommodation. In accommodation, the threshold potential adapts to new values of the membrane voltage. So if we're firing a lot of action potentials, then the membrane voltage will become depolarized. This will cause the threshold to go up, and our rate of firing will go down. At some point, the inhibited neuron will no longer be able to inhibit its neighbor enough to keep it suppressed. The neighbor will then take over and begin firing, which will inhibit the first neuron. To see this better, let's go back and delete the synapses that we just added. Then select both neurons and set the relative accommodation to 0.7 and the accommodation time constant to 200 milliseconds. Run the simulator. This time both of our neurons begin firing action potentials but the firing rate falls off and eventually stops as the threshold adapts. Now let's go and add back our inhibitory synapses and run the simulation again.
great. We just built a simple oscillator. Now that we have an oscillator that can control some aspect of our movement, it's finally time to connect it up to the body and make it actually do something. Start by opening the body editor again. We want to test the motion without anything like the ground interfering. So move the organism 20 centimeters in the air and then freeze it. Now go back to the behavioral editor and add a non-spiking neuron to the diagram. We will use the membrane voltage from this neuron to drive a motor in the elbow of our organism. Both neurons in our oscillator will be connected to it, but one will be an excitatory connection and the other will be inhibitory. This will allow us to have a set point and depending on which of the neurons are firing, it will drive us from that set value. Name the non-spiking neuron EDR for E-drive and then change its membrane potential to negative 50 millivolts. This will be our set point. Also, change its time constant to 100 milliseconds. This will allow it to integrate the incoming spikes from the other neurons and produce some lasting change. Connect E back to EDR using a hyperpolarizing IPSP synapse. And connect E forward to EDR using a nicotinic acetylcholine synapse. Change the conductance of both to 1 microsiemens. And then go back to our data chart and add a new axis. Name it drive voltage. Then add the membrane voltage from EDR and change its color. Now let's run the simulation again, and you should see the drive voltage fluctuate around negative 50 millivolts. Okay, this simulation is running a bit slowly with the data we're collecting and the video recording software running in the background. Go back to the environment node in the project workspace and increase the physics time step to 3 milliseconds. Next, go back and select the data chart and set the update data interval to 1000 milliseconds and the collect time window to 3 seconds. The update data interval tells the chart how often it should update its data. If we increase this time, it will update less often and be less of a burden on the CPU. Run the simulation again and you can see that things run a good deal faster. Now let's actually connect EDR to the motor. Add a joint node to the diagram and change its name to LU Elbow. Go to its properties and find Joint ID. Click on the drop down. This displays a hierarchical list of all the joints in our organism. Select LU underscore body to elbow. We've just associated this joint node in the behavioral editor to a physical joint in our body. There are several node types that work as placeholders like this. They allow you to interface behavioral nodes to the virtual world and to other subsystems. Now draw a connection between EDR and LU elbow. This time, a new node was added in between our connection. In Animat Lab, all connections between the virtual world and neural nodes or between nodes in different modules must use an adapter. An adapter is a type of transfer function. It lets us map the output signal of our node into values that can be understood by our motor. In this case, we'll be mapping membrane voltage from EDR into a desired velocity for the motor in meters per second. Rename the adapter EAD and then go to its properties. The source data type lets us specify what type of data we will be transforming. 
There is no target data type. This is because all nodes of a given type interpret input data in the same way. So if your target node is a neuron, it will always interpret its input as current. Or, as in the present case, a joint will always interpret input data as desired velocity. Click on the button in the Gain property to open the Gain Editor. This is what specifies the transfer function that will be used to map the input variable to the output. Currently, there are three types of functions that can be used, polynomial, bell, and sigmoid. We'll stick with polynomial. If you look at the axis of our graph, it shows that we will be converting membrane voltage into desired velocity. Now we just need to find a function that will perform this conversion. Let's start by looking at the range over which our driving signal oscillates. By looking back at our graph, we can see that it fluctuates between negative 25 and negative 70 millivolts. This gives us a range of 45 millivolts. We need to pick a range over which our motor will operate. For starters, let's choose 100 to negative 100 centimeters per second. Now we need to use a little high school algebra for the equation for a straight line, y equals mx plus b. Our rise is negative 200 centimeters per second, and our run is 45 millivolts. This gives us a slope of negative 4.44. We know that the velocity should be zero at our set point of negative 50 millivolts. So use that to calculate the slope, and we end up with negative 0.22. However, we simply picked our motor range from thin air. It may be too slow or too fast for the amount of stimulation that we're applying. So this is an iterative process. You would start with these numbers and then tweak the values to get something that works at the speed you want. Of course, if you know the exact speed that's needed, then this will constrain that value. But in this instance, we're just eyeballing it. I've already done this and found that the values of negative 133 for the slope and negative 6.7 for the intercept work well. So let's enter this into the gain property and hit OK. Run the simulation again. Hmm, nothing happens. This brings us to another important point. There are a couple of things that you always have to set when controlling joints. The first is to make sure that you didn't forget to assign the joint ID. If you do, then your drive neuron will be generating a signal, but that signal would not actually be applied to anything because you never told it which joint to use. The second is that for a motor to work, you have to enable it. Go back to the body editor and find our joint and then set enable motor to true. Now let's run the simulation again. Great! We finally produced some movement. It looks a little jerky here, but that's mainly because of the data chart and the video being recorded in the background on my computer. If we close down the data chart, it should be a little bit better, and it should be much smoother on your computer. Okay, now that we have our elbow moving back and forth, let's add movement in the up and down direction. Go back to the behavioral editor and select the entire circuit that we just built copy and paste it. Then change all the E's for elbow to A's for arm and change back to up and forward to down. Finally, change the joint ID for the arm to LU underscore elbow to arm. Then let's go back and enable the left upper arm joint motor and run our simulation again. Well, we have both types of motion now, but they're not synchronized. Let's see what we can do about that. First, we'll need a command neuron that will control our walking. Go back to the top diagram and add a spiking neuron named walk. Now go back to our leg diagram and add two new spiking neurons.
named the first CG for contact ground and the second IA for in air. We're trying to split the cycles of our two oscillators up into different phases. One will be when the legs are on the ground and the other will be when they're in the air. Add inhibitory connections from CG to E back and E forward. Then add inhibitory connections from IA to A up and A down. Next add an inhibitory connection from CG to IA. This will ensure that only one of these neurons is active at the same time and the one that is active will be controlled by the walk neuron. Now let's add a little synchronization between our two oscillators. Add an inhibitory connection from A up to E forward. This will make sure that when A up is on then E back should be on as well. Next, we'll connect CG to the walk neuron using an off-page connector. This type of node allows you to connect items in one diagram with items in another diagram. It basically fills in for that node. Just as you did with the joint node, you must tell the connector what neuron it is filling in for. You can do this using the linked node property. Select the walk neuron. Add a nicotinic acetylcholine synapse between walk and CG. Now go back and change the conductances to 1 microsiemens for all of the synapses except A up to E forward. It would be nice if our organism was driven by whether or not its arm is touching the ground. But for now we'll cheat a little bit and just drive it manually. Add a repetitive current stimulus to the walk neuron. Then change its name to walk current and set its on off cycle duration to 500 milliseconds, its on cycle current to 40 nanoamps, and then make sure it's always active. Run the simulation again. Well, that's a little better, but still not great. However, once we get the other legs added, it should be much easier to synchronize them. Let's go ahead and add the circuits for the other legs. First, add LU to the name of all the neurons in our current circuit. Then go back to the top diagram and copy and paste our left upper leg subsystem. Change its name to left lower leg. Then go into it and change LU in each of its nodes to LL for lower leg instead.
Finally, don't forget to set the joint IDs to their new values. Now let's run the simulator again. Hmm, nothing happened. Oh! We forgot to enable our motors for our right legs. Let's go back and enable all the motors now so that we no longer have to worry about that. Let's try it one more time. This time we have both of our left legs moving. Now let's repeat the process of copying and pasting our subsystems to create the circuits for the legs on the right side. However, there is one small difference this time from when we did the legs on the left side. If you remember, we had to reverse our elbow joint because it was reflected around the body. This means that its orientation will be reversed and our adapter needs to match this. Go back to the gain editor for the right elbow joints and switch the values to positive instead of negative.
Let's run the simulation again, and this time all of our legs should be moving. Again, there's no synchronization between the movement of the legs. Let's go ahead and fix this once and for all. We'll do this by adding inhibition between adjacent legs. Go back to the upper left leg and add two sets of off-page connectors. The E-back neuron will be inhibited by the E-forward neuron of two adjacent legs, and the A-up neuron will be inhibited by the A-down neuron of the adjacent legs. Since we're doing the left upper leg, then its two adjacent legs are the ones across from it and the one below it. This is the right upper leg and the left lower leg. Now create the inhibitory connections from our off-page connectors to E back and A up. Change the synaptic conductance for the new synapses to be one microsiemen. Copy our new off-page connectors and let's add them to the rest of the leg circuits. The left lower leg will be inhibited by the right lower leg and the left upper leg. The right upper leg will be inhibited by the left upper leg and the right lower leg. The right lower leg will be inhibited by the left lower leg and the right upper leg.
Okay. We have all of the adjacent legs inhibiting each other. Let's run the simulation again and see if it worked. Cool. Our legs are now working together. But there's still a mystery that needs to be discussed. We have two oscillators per leg, but it appears that the back and forward neurons are alternating and the reason is not apparent at first. Let's explore this more by looking at some data. Go back to our data chart and delete the drive voltage axis and add a new one that we will label thresholds. Then add new items for each of the elbow neurons for our left upper leg. Select thresholds as the data type. This will plot the threshold that determines at what membrane voltage action potentials are generated. Add a third axis and display the membrane voltages for our arm oscillator neurons for the left upper leg. Run the simulation again. Now the reason for the alternation becomes apparent if we look at the thresholds. As one of the neurons, like E back, fires, its threshold increases. But the next time that the elbow oscillator needs to fire, this neuron's threshold has not fallen all the way back down. It's higher than the threshold for the other neuron. This means that E forward will be able to fire action potentials more easily and will win the competition and be the one that bursts. This forms a cyclical pattern within our oscillator circuits that enforces the pattern that we want. Now all that's left is to put the organism back on the ground and let it crawl around. Go back to the body editor and set its Y value to 1.5 centimeters and then unfreeze its body. Now let's run the simulator again. Great, that's it. We've successfully built a simple organism that can crawl around under its own power. As I said when we started, it's a fairly simple behavior, but the amount of thought we had to put into it to get all of the parts of the neural system to work together with the body to produce this behavior was pretty intense. I hope this tutorial has given you a good idea of how to use AnimatLab for your own purposes, and of how complex even the simplest organisms can be.